you said that really you don't believe there are mass people and not mass people. But, you know, you'll need to convince, you know, I'm sorry, let me, let me rephrase that. Um, so you don't believe really that, you know, some people are mass people and there are others people who should just give up on mass, but a lot of other people will need to be convinced about that. They're very convinced that they're not, not mass people. So how do you go about convincing someone who has that mindset that there's nothing in it for them, that mass could be of interest and perhaps they should think more mathematically? Well, I think the first thing not to do is to whack them over the head with the textbook and say you're wrong because that is patently an unhelpful way to respond to, quite frankly, a lot of people's trauma in the way that they learned mathematics. I'll never forget running a workshop in Regional New South Wales and a lovely, very small 80-year-old woman coming out to the front of the hall after the event was finished and she said, I wish maths was taught the way you taught it when I was younger. When I was taught it, we would all write our answers to a question on our hand and our teacher would say, okay, raise your hands now, everyone, and show me the answer that you've got so I can read it. And then my teacher would go out the front to her desk. She would open a drawer and she'd pull out her cane. And if any of us had the wrong answer on our hand, we never forgot it for the rest of our lives. There's a lot of, maybe not that extreme, but some version of that. No, no one likes to feel stupid. No one likes being placed under that pressure of, goodness me, I don't know the answer to this. I must be an idiot. I can't learn this stuff. And so the first thing to do is to acknowledge there's some pain and difficulty and struggle underneath that, that I want to empathize with and say, I get it. The feeling that you have that mass is not for you is really plausible. I understand it. I don't want to dismiss it. But, or rather, and there is a way to connect maths to you. You just don't know it yet. So mathematics can have a reputation for being abstract because the way that we often teach it is in symbols, in X's and Y's that quite deliberately obscure what it is that those X's and Y's stand for. Are these population numbers? Are they heights? Are they temperatures? The fact that they're X and Y's are, the point is that they could be anything. And that's, that's where their superpower comes from. Mathematics has this universality that is why it's used in every endeavor that humans have ever been interested in, because it can solve any kind of problem. But that abstractness is a two-edged sword. It can make it feel like it has nothing to do with anything that I care about. And I remember once a conversation I had right before I gave a TED talk at uh, the International Convention Center in Sydney, and I was the first talk, and myself and a musician, her name was Adette, she's a pianist and, uh, and a singer, very, very gifted. She was the first performer, and so we were standing backstage waiting for the call. And we had a lot of time on our hands because it was one of those hurry up and wait type situations where call time was an hour before we were actually due to get on stage. And so we had the opportunity to actually have a real conversation. And she said to me, oh, so what, what do you do? And I said, well, I, I'm a maths teacher. And frankly, that's usually the end of the conversation <laughs> in most cases. But because we had you know, three quarters of an hour at this point to wait, I, I just sort of explained, you know, this is what I do. And she said to me, oh, I could never do maths. I just, I just hate the subject. And because I had the time, I said to her, tell me, tell me what it means to me, to you rather to be a musician, what, what, does, what does composing look like to you? What, what makes a great song? And she started to explain to me about, about the meaning of, of rhythms and, and melodies and harmonies and how they all fit together in a beautiful symmetry and the structure of a song. And I said to her, that is all mathematics. Mathematics is like music to the mind in the way that music is like mathematics to the soul. And so being able to say, okay, for you, your world is music. I know enough about mathematics to connect my world to yours. I think every teacher of any subject, but particularly mathematics, has a responsibility and a privilege of being able to say, you don't know how this is connected to you, but let me show you. you know Parents are so invested in their children and these important developmental years, particularly at school. 
Do you think parents should be confident that our school curriculums are up to the task of uh, teaching the transferable skills and the critical mindsets that children are going to need when they graduate into this rapid, fast-changing world? Hmm. A simple answer to that question, if there isn't a simple answer to this question, is yes, they are. I do remember the first time that uh, an academic, I won't name her because this is a statement which she might not be happy with me pinning uh, against her name, but she said to me uh, in a very... um, in a moment of great trust, and I really appreciated her saying this to me, but I felt rattled by it. When she was talking about the curriculum that you're just referring to, she said, Eddie, you need to understand. Curriculum, syllabus documents, they are not documents that have been crafted to provide students with the best learning experience. They are objects that have been created through a political process to satisfy (laughs) The stakeholders at play, many of whom have competing and sometimes contradictory priorities. And what you have in your hands as a teacher is almost a a Frankenstein-esque composition of different ideas, some of which are truly clashing with each other, that you should not have rose-colored glasses uh, on when you read. It's, It's a document that's been born out of this very pragmatic process. And I was rattled by that statement because as a much younger, more idealistic, naive, I would say, teacher, I thought, well, if, if that's the case, what hope do we have? It, to your point before, is this going to be enough for students? Can I, can I, with my hand on my heart, say that I can use this to provide students with what they need moving forward? And I came to realize the answer is yes, because despite coming to us by such a roundabout a uh, strange, circuitous process, actually, enough thought, design, and intent have gone into, certainly within Australia and a lot of the international jurisdictions I've looked at from the UK, US, Singapore, Ireland, you know, it's, there's a bunch of different ones which all look different, but they share enough in common that actually they are a launching off point for the teacher and for the student themselves to be able to say, here are the the foundational concepts, the places that if I were imagining giving a tour of Europe, you would say, look down this alleyway. There's a thousand years of history in this pavement. Now look up, cast your eyes to that cathedral in the distance. We're not going to get there today. But let me tell you what you should look out for when you start heading in that direction. And then there are mountains beyond that, which you will only be able to experience if you understand where you are situated and how to get there and how they're all related to each other. There is plenty of wonderful material, certainly in the syllabus that I have the privilege of teaching, that does give me great hope. In fact, more than hope, confidence that when used well, equips students for whatever future is coming for them. We've got to wrap up, but but I, I want you to give two pieces of advice if we can. Um, I mean, you are, you know, we're talking in Australia. You're Australia's most famous teacher in Australia, and you're the teacher in Australia who has more global recognition than anyone else. So, you know, if you're a parent engaged with your child and wanting to equip your children to be lifelong learners. What advice to those parents? Sometimes the the advice we're best at giving is the one we need to pay attention to ourselves. I I love that. One of my favorite lines is, we teach best that which we most need to learn. (laughs) Right. So what do you need to learn as a parent? (laughs) Well, I think of my two high school aged children and my one primary school aged child. And I think... In fact, I don't just think, I remember to those moments that my children themselves have told me have been most instrumental in helping them to to move forward as learners, particularly through, for example, some of the, the tricky years we've experienced through this global pandemic and the very different position that it placed parents in, uh, in helping to cultivate their child's learning. And I've realized that most of what I've been able to give my children that has been of most value value to them 
And I hope this gives positivity to our listeners. They've not come from any of my training as a teacher. They've come from my priority on empathy to my fellow human being. Because I think that the most valuable thing that we as parents can give to our children is to come alongside them and to say, hey, what is that? Tell me about that. Explain to me this poem that you're reading with some embarrassment, despite the fact that I love English and I studied it to the highest level possible in New South Wales high schools. I never really wrapped my head around poetry when I was at school. And I regretted that. I went through many years of my life thinking, well, that's just a door that's closed forever. And it was with delight that my daughter came home with a poem from Yeats. And she said, we're learning this and it's amazing. And in that moment, I had a choice. I could say, number one, okay. And then move on with the hundred different things that I had to do that day and not pay any further attention. Number two, I could say, oh, poetry. I hated poetry. Good luck with that. Or number three, and obviously there's a, a spectrum of infinite different options here, but number three, what I chose to do and what I know she found valuable was to sit beside my daughter and to have her explain to me, to be in the position of the learner with her because that posture and that time signaled to her more than any pedagogical technique or strategy I ever learned at university or came to learn while I was an in-service teacher. More than any of those, it reaffirmed to her the value and the dignity of what she was doing and therefore it was worth her precious time and effort. And even more than that, I would think, it's almost like the reverse of what you were saying about Feynman. The fact that she needs to be able to explain that to you, that you're turning yourself into a learner, but you're helping her become a teacher and to, to think and to be able to explain that complexity to you is an important part of the learning experience for her as well. What advice to the students who are listening, you know, who have a life of learning ahead? We run graduations here at the university. We say it's not a finishing line. It's just a milestone. You're going to be learning forever. So, you know, what do they need to do to be fully equipped to be lifelong learners? I think having an attitude of knowing that you will learn something from everything. It might be by counterexample, but you will truly learn something from every different life experience that you're ever going to encounter. And in some ways, you're going to learn the most when you expect it the least. And my favorite example of this is that I'm a bit of an audio junkie. I'm not just saying that because we're on a podcast right now, but I am someone who listens to an eclectic mix of different podcasts. And one of the things I love about that is that I love surprising myself with something that looks like it'll have no interest to me, no connection to what it is that I have to do, that I, I want to become better at, but I'll suspend judgment long enough to hit download, to listen in, and without exception, I find ideas that cross over with my world in ways that I never anticipated. This happens to me enough that I now know to expect. If I think there's nothing to do with me in this, then uh, I just need to give it a bit of time. I'm Mark Scott, Vice-Chancellor of the University of Sydney, and a huge thanks to Eddie Wu for his insights today. Eddie is Professor of Practice in the School of Education at the University of Sydney, a high school maths teacher, and one of my all-time favourite YouTubers. Make sure you're following The Solutionists in your favourite podcast app so you never miss a chance to meet the brightest minds working to solve the most complex issues, the people who are making change happen.